It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. For the first time, I want to introduce you to Dr. Michael Bussler. He is a public policy analyst. He's an economics expert. He's a professor of finance at Stockton University in New Jersey. And he's a featured columnist at Newsmax, Life's Ad, and Townhall.com. Dr. Bussler, welcome to the program. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning to you, Paul. It's my pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. I'm glad that you could make it. Uh, and the uh, yeah. reason I, I wanted to have you on is, is you know, I you know, want to pick your brain about what the media is doing. I've noticed a shift in the mainstream media. Uh, you've got yeah. an economy that's doing pretty good. Uh, Trump's starting to get the credit for it according to the polls, and they're trying to rewrite history. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, the economy is doing very well, and in my view, it's going to continue to do even better into the short-term and perhaps long-term future. Uh, the reason is President Trump has got economic growth up significantly, um, and as a result of that, uh, we're coming into this robust economy, and he has done this basically by reversing much of what President Obama did. President Obama is the first and only president in history to serve a term in office without having at least one year where annual economic growth was at least 3%. He averaged a little over 2% for his entire uh, time, time in office. And the reason is simple. His primary goal was not economic growth. His primary goal was to cure perceived social injustices. It's an injustice that everybody doesn't have health care. It's an injustice that CEOs make three or 400 times what the average uh, employee makes. It's an injustice there's not enough food stamps to go around. It's an injustice uh, that big business is taking advantage of consumers. So what President Obama did, uh, all of his actions to cure those perceived social injustices ended up slowing economic growth, for instance. Um, the, one of the first things he did was uh, have the Affordable Care Act passed uh, that uh, provided health care for a, a, another 6% of the population. We had 85% with health insurance before the Affordable Care Act jumped up to 91%, so it helped about 6% of the population. The problem is it tended to slow economic growth, and the reasons are simple. There were 23 new or raised taxes in the Affordable Care Act. So what that did was reduce um, consumption, disposable income and consumption uh, for consumers tended to slow economic growth. The Affordable Care Act also required uh, that em employers uh, provide health insurance for all employees or face a $3,000 fine. That added to the cost of labor, again, tended to slow economic uh, uh, growth. President Obama, uh, also with the uh, President Bush passed tax cuts in 2001. They were going to last for 10 years. They expired in 2011. President <clears throat> Obama uh, extended them for everybody except the upper class. The upper class, the highest tax bracket, had their taxes raised by 10%. Well, that reduced the amount of investment capital that uh, the higher income earners could put back into the economy by reducing the amount of capital. We have a capital-intensive economy. By reducing the amount of capital going in, that tended to slow economic mm. uh, growth. Then uh, President Obama put in thousands of regulations that he felt would help consumers, um, and they ended up making it harder for business to expand, and that tended to slow economic uh, growth. One thing he did was convince Congress to pass the Dodd-Frank bill. Now, President Obama felt that much of the financial crisis was caused by what he called predatory lending, which means banks made loans to people who really can't afford it. So he passed Dodd-Frank, <clears throat> which eliminated predatory lending, but it also almost eliminated most other lending. Well, if banks are not lending money, monetary policy is not going to be effective. So that tended to slow economic growth. So what happened? Uh, President Trump gets into office. The first thing he can do on his own through executive orders would be to reverse a lot of these counterproductive regulations, which he did. 
since he did that, the economy has been growing at over a 3% rate. Then he convinced Congress Dodd-Frank was uh, slowing down economic growth and holding the economy back. He got Congress to repeal part of that, went into effect this year. He also said, uh, look, if we really want to get growth um, increased, let's take a look at what past presidents have done. So he looked at what Reagan did in 1981-82, and he looked at what Kennedy and Johnson did at 63-64, and he said, look, in both instances, they reduced taxes for all Americans, all the way up and down, middle class, upper class, everybody. Taxes were reduced, and the economy took off. So he convinced his Congress last November to reduce taxes for everybody. That went into effect in January of this year. By April of this year, the economy was growing at over a 4% rate, and it's my view that uh, the third quarter of this year, the number won't be announced until the end of October, we're probably going to see a 4.5% growth. And it wouldn't surprise me to see a quarter next year where economic growth exceeded even 5%. 1982, when Reagan's tax cut went into effect, in 1984, economic growth for the year was 7.5%. So, the growth that we're getting now and the robust economy is all due to President Trump essentially reversing much of what uh, President Obama did, uh, putting um, uh, government out of the way of business, letting business um, go in the marketplace and pursue opportunities. That's adding um, all the growth that we're seeing now and I believe into the uh future. So it's President Trump who should get complete credit for what's happening today in the economy. Uh, and I agree with that. And I we're talking with Dr. Michael Bussler, a uh, public policy analyst. Uh, he is a professor uh, of finance at Stockton University in New Jersey. Um, I agree with what you're saying, and I'm glad you're setting the record straight. We have the media. Uh, I think they're seeing this. I think they also see that the average American, I mean, I saw a poll last week I know from Turning Point USA, Candace Owens, she talked about how black support for Trump has doubled, according to one poll from last year to now. The mainstream media sees this and they say, oh, we've got to figure out a way to say that, uh, you know, President Obama is responsible for all of this. And, you know, that you're starting to see that they're they're trying to promote this idea that this is Obama's economy. Yeah, and clearly, uh, clearly it isn't uh, President Obama's economy. And, you know, the, the press. Um, I've seen three different studies, and they all come about to the same conclusion. More than 90% of what the press writes about President Trump is negative. Uh, They've lost a lot of their objectivity. They feel they have a a duty uh, to somehow minimize the effects of what President Trump is doing. In fact, they'd like to get him out of office sooner if they, they could. The mainstream media is supposed to report factually on what's happening without a bias in the reporting. Now, you certainly have your opinions, uh, and on your opinion pages, you're allowed to uh, give what your opinions of what is happening, uh, what your opinions are. But when it comes to reporting the news, it's got to be done on a factual basis. And what what is being done is always done on such a slanted uh, basis that it's not really factual news, and it even gets to the point where President Trump says, look, some of the things you say, saying, you're saying just aren't true. Mm-hmm. And he refers to that as, as fake news. And then he uses the term enemy the, of the people, and everybody was all up in arms about that. We had last Thursday, was it, the 300 editorial yep. uh, mm-hmm. um, in, in uh, uh, saying what President Trump is doing is um, wrong. Um The the mainstream media has got to start reporting things factually. If they're providing inaccurate information to the voters and the voters are making decisions based on inaccurate information, you end up causing chaos with democracy. That's what the Russians are trying to do. The Russians are trying to put out inaccurate information so people will make bad, uh, uninformed decisions. The media is almost doing the same thing that the Russians are doing by providing inaccurate information well, to these leaders. Yeah, it's it's kind of, you know, 
I, I've described it before. You know, there's so many people that consume the mainstream media. They think that they're being told the truth. And, you know, when you think that you're free and you think that you're, you know, being told the truth, I mean, that's, I mean, that's extremely powerful, you know, and that's, that's better. Yeah. That's way better than an outright totalitarian state. You know what I'm saying? Where yeah. you have the illusion yeah. of objectivity and the illusion of choice. Um, and I would just say that, you know, the facts that you went through, I mean, you talked and, you know, quite uh, eloquently about all of the regulations that Obama put in, the taxes that Obama put in. You know, can, can you imagine if if that's if that made a report on CNN where they it would never happen where you would say, well, no. why does Trump? Well, this is what Trump did. He cut taxes and he rolled back everything Obama had done. I mean, that's the facts. I mean. You know, right. you could argue cause and effect, but the facts are he did these things that were uh, supposed to help the economy, and we now have positive economic results. Make your own conclusions. Draw your own conclusions, America. But this is what happened. They would never do that. They have to editorialize. That's exactly right. And, you know, a lot of the uh, anger, I think, that's being felt in America today is a result of this slow growth economy again if you look back in history it goes back even a little further than obama we have it the u.s hasn't had economic growth of at least three percent since 2005 we haven't had economic growth of four percent since the year 2000 that's the longest period in my view of economic stagnation in the u.s history Pres uh, president trump is reversing this now as a result of that bad economy for so long uh, you get a lot of frustrated Americans. For instance, I, um, college graduates for the last 10 years, and I've seen it with my students, uh, over the last 10 years, they struggle to get one good job offer when they graduate. Many times, um, college graduates have taken jobs for which they're overqualified simply because there's a no-growth economy and there aren't good jobs available. So they take jobs for which they're overqualified. You don't need to college degree necessarily um so they get very frustrated with the hat especially when they're carrying a lot of debt as a result of the college grads taking those jobs then the people without college degrees they don't have any opportunity at all they drop out of the labor force become what we call discouraged workers probably five or six million of those and that leads to a lot of frustration and people start blaming each other for uh, their bad uh, plight once the growth gets going as it is today, and we're already starting to see it, a lot of underemployed college graduates are now finding jobs that take advantage of their degree. That opens up jobs for people who have less than a, uh, a college degree. And starting in June, those people started flocking back into the labor force. So yep. the participation rate is starting to go up. I think that's going to get rid of a lot of that anger in America, and we can start working together rather than fighting each other all the time. We're talking with Dr. Michael Bussler, a public policy analyst, professor at Stockton University, uh, you know, and he knows what he's talking about, clearly, folks. But, uh, Dr. Bussler, I would, I'm curious, you know, you did mention yeah. all the stuff that Trump has done uh, in terms of, uh, you know, rolling back regulations and things like this. But what about the, what is your opinion on the tariff situation and, um, you know, now we have China coming back to the table and they're saying right. we will negotiate now because, you know, our economy is not we doing so to. hot now. I mean, that also, I think, has a lot to do with maybe some some confidence. I mean, you have at least Trump saying I know there's some debate as to how effective it is. It seems pretty effective yep. to me. But you have a psychological confidence here where the president's going to bat for the middle class, and the American worker versus yep. President Obama that told small business owners they didn't build their business and demonized millionaires and billionaires, you know, his entire eight years. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I'm a free market economist. You mentioned the word tariff or taxes, and my stomach starts to churn. I understand. Um, pre pre President Trump wants a free and fair trade policy. His goal would be, I'm not sure he's quite going to get there, but his goal would be to have no tariffs on anything. So President Trump gets into office and he says, look, I'd like to put to my trading partners, we need to renegotiate these lopsided trade deals. For instance, if the European, in, uh, in Europe, 
Um, if they build a car in Germany or uh, Italy and sell it in the U.S., we charge them a 2.5% tariff. If an American car company makes a car company and sells it in Europe, they charge us a 10% tariff. So the result is we import a lot of their cars, which means our money flows out of the country when we pay for them. They import very few of our cars, so none of their money is flowing into our country, and we have this negative balance of trade to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars every year. So President Trump said, look, I want to renegotiate this with everybody. NAFTA uh, is similarly lopsided toward our trading partners. I want to renegotiate this. Well, the trading partners, they're in no hurry to renegotiate this. They have favorable positions. Now, remember, President Trump is a business person. He's not a politician. So a business person, when you're confronted with a problem like this, you don't do what politicians do. They would convene a summit sometime in the fall. They'd come back and discuss it next year. They'd uh, wait till next fall to reconvene again, and then they'd kick the can down the road to the next guy. Well, President Trump is a business person. A business person, if you see a problem, especially if it's going to affect your bottom line, you um, confront that problem immediately and resolve it. So President Trump had to do something to bring the trading partners to the table as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Again, a business person in that situation would create a sense of urgency. So how did he do that? He starts slapping these tariffs on everybody, and we're in a much stronger position than all of our trading partners. So this is going to hurt them much more than it's going to hurt us, and he, he knew that. So by putting on these, these tariffs, all of a sudden, these uh, our trading partners saying, wait a minute, we, we can't do this. we got to have to renegotiate something. So before you know it, two weeks ago, the European Union comes over and says, you know, Trump's right. We're going to work towards trying to get no tariffs on anything. The president of Mexico the week last week came in and said, uh, look, we have to renegotiate this NAFTA as soon as, as, as possible. And as you just mentioned, uh, I think today or tomorrow, the Chinese delegation is coming over here to renegotiate these uh, trade deals. So President Trump is doing what any business person would do, confront the problem immediately, create a sense of urgency so everybody comes to the table. His goal is to get the no tariff, completely free and fair trade as soon as possible. I think by the end of the year, um, if these aren't all resolved, that we'll at least be taking steps to come up with a resolution that will benefit American manufacturers into the future because it will open up markets to them that because of these lopsided trade agreements that haven't been open to them forever, now these markets will be open. Even if there's a little short-term pain this year, mm. it'll be much long-term gain. Uh, I, I agree with you, and I really appreciate that, that analysis. That's a really... Uh, really insightful analysis. Um, uh, we, we're out of time, Dr. M Michael Buster, but uh, I, I really, I, I'd love to have you on again sometime. And uh, can we, do you tweet or Facebook or anything? I, I just would love to give our audience yeah. a way to follow you or something. Sure. So all of my columns, I write uh, uh, one to two columns a week and I've been doing it for years. Uh, my Twitter account is at mbustler, M-B-U-S-L-E-R, so you can see everything there. I have a Facebook page. Um, it's called Funding Democracy, the Economics of Freedom. So it's facebook.com forward slash funding democracy. Or if you just go to Facebook and search funding democracy, it'll come up there. If you follow me, I'll, uh, you'll be able to see everything everything that I write. I appreciate it. All right. So on Twitter, that's at M, uh, as, in, um, as in Michael, right. at Michael. M yep. Bustler, B-U-S-L-E-R. I'm going to follow you right, right now. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure, Dr. Bustler. Thanks so much for coming on this morning. Thank you. My pleasure, too. All righty. Take care. All right, folks, we got to take a break. It's Conduit News Radio. I want to direct you to the brand new conduitnews.com. That was our big announcement. Brand new website, conduitnews.com. Go there for stories as well as insightful interviews like you just heard back in just.